is an HP News Network special report. Welcome YouTubers and anti-nuke activists to another HP News Network special report. This is your host, Patrick Penry, and I want to jump right into some Nuclear Regulatory Commission Freedom of Information Act documents. Again, they are free and available to the public online. Anyone can search through these and write about this information as I do. And I, and I tell you right now, this information is being suppressed on a scale never before seen. In fact, there's an orchestrated disinformation network that is promoting a completely different story than what you find in these documents. Now, I've been adamant since February 2012. This disinformation ring is orchestrated. They're working together. They're cohesive. They're organized. They communicate. They all promote the same story, just like the mainstream media does. And as I've said before, now's a great time to see who's working for the establishment and who is not. Okay, let's jump right into these documents and let's look at some more documentation on Unit 4. And in a minute, if you stick with me, I'm going to look at some documentation from Unit 3, which had the MOX fuel. We know for sure Unit 3 had MOX fuel. I, I keep hearing little stories in the background that maybe Unit 4 did too, but I can't prove that. I'm just trying to, what evidence is in these documents that tends to prove a particular thing. I try to post that up, and if it's hearsay, I'll let you know that, or if it's conjecture, I'll, you know, I'll let you know that as well. And I give a lot of opinion, too. I apologize for that. I'll try to just stick to the uh, documentation today. So let's have a look at the first screen capture from the NRC Freedom of Information Act documentation pertaining to Fukushima. And this is a brief. There's a lot of briefs in these, in these documents as you go through them. Remember, they blizzarded us with... 50 million zillion documents at once and they quadruplicated some stuff within so you'll read a 900 page document and about five to ten pages might be real original singular unique information the rest is duplicated so you'll scroll through a line of a hundred pages and if you're not careful you'll pass up a single email that's really critical so they hid this information they blizzarded the information they've done their best to keep us from getting the information out now here's what this brief reads from the 16th, 2011 of March, 809 EDT, article on Fox News website, parentheses, Japanese officials scramble to contain nuclear power plant crisis, close parentheses. The following statement is provided, quote, Japanese officials told the IAEA that the reactor fire was in a storage pond and that, quote, radioactivity is being released directly into the atmosphere, end quote. Long after the fire was extinguished, a Japanese official said the pool where used nuclear fuel is kept cool might be boiling. Quote, we cannot deny the possibility of water boiling, end quote, in the pool, said Hadahiko Nishiyama, an official with the Economy Ministry, which oversees nuclear safety, end quote. This information was provided, was providing context for the observed fires at the site, implying Unit 4. If so, it conflicts with information from WANO, World Association of Nuclear Operators, I believe is what that stands for, Tokyo, who has identified the fires as occurring in the Recirc Motor MG set area, which is one level below the operating floor. And I need to add here, folks, that in this documentation, the NRC is adamant that it was not a lube oil fire, as TEPCO officials try to insist. In fact, they were staking their reputations that it was not a lube oil fire and that it was a quote-unquote seminal event. Well, that is likely Unit 4 as it melted down. That was the event. And we have evidence in these documents. They actually pulled workers back when that happened. The, the rad levels were too high to send anybody in, even for a short amount of time. Okay, next screen capture continues on this brief. The NRC, via a briefing with international nuclear plant operators, indicated... Integrity of the Unit 4 spent fuel pool is compromised per NRC staff members in Japan who have seen pictures of the spent fuel pool. Also, I might add Moniger and, and at least one other were embedded with TEPCO officials, so they, were, they had first-hand information. They were there listening to the TEPCO officials as they discussed the actual situation. Updated info from NRC. 1400 EDT is that the retaining wall has collapsed although the liner appears to be intact. Per informal input from EPRI, 
on 316 2011 1225 EDT indicated that the wall may have failed at 1300 on 316 2011. And that's probably fairly accurate right there. It's a time frame of when we had the enough loss of water to cause a zirconium fire. The IAEA reported there was a spent fuel pool fire and radiation released directly to the atmosphere. It goes on to say, it is now believed that several fires may have occurred in the spent fuel pool. Per WANO Tokyo, TEPCO was planning on using helicopters to add water to the pool, but abandoned the plan because a hole in the roof was not in line with the pool. That's critical, folks. What little bit they could scatter on it with a helicopter or with a water cannon was very difficult to get the water in there as the roof had collapsed and, and you had to get in, try to get in through this hole, which was not in line with the pool. The water would have dripped into another location. So again, it was a a series of the worst possible outcomes you could have had is exactly what happened. Temperature of the Unit 3 and 5 spent fuel pools are increasing. Degradation of Unit 3 liner was also observed in pictures, although currently not as severe as Unit 4. NRC update as of 1400 EDT indicates that the spent fuel pool may be leaking. If the Unit 3 and 4 pools do have water, it is minimal. And that's what Chuck Casto said as well when there was a conversation between the head of the public affairs for NRC, uh, Elliot Brenner, Chuck Casto, and Gregory Jaxco. And the gist of the conversation was as Jasco, Jaxco checks with Casto to make sure his call on the spent fuel pool is correct. Casto says if there's any water in there, it's very minimal. It won't be there very long. Brenner says, you're making the right call. They say, yes, okay, phone conversation done. So there was a, a, a recheck to make sure they were making the right call. And they all agreed at that time that was the right call to be made. And Castro stuck to his word all along. His story never changed. And that guy, out of all these people I read about in the documents, if I had any respect for anyone, it would be Chuck Casto. I don't know where they moved him to now. My mom says they moved him off somewhere. Jack's goes gone. Department of Energy Stephen Chu is gone. They're sending him down the road because they don't want us to catch up with him and start asking pertinent questions to these individuals. The Unit 1 and 2 may become susceptible within some period of time. It is now believed that the up and down spikes being experienced at the site are being driven by releases from the spent fuel pool. It is now believed that the up and down spikes, okay, it's repeating that again. Some, I guess say some stuff is duplicated in here, but usually in a bigger way. Like they'll take something that's irrelevant, that's 10 pages long, and insert it in that 900 page document 10, 15 times. So you're constantly seeing, in fact, what you do is you just scroll through at a high speed and you just look for shapes and geometric figures. And that's how I can tell when the, you know, what they are duplicating stops. And I begin to look at some of these uh, pertinent emails that are very, very relevant. Now you can miss them if you don't don't know how to dig through these documents, but if you take your time, you'll eventually find all this information. It is located within the FOIA documents. NRC Commissioner Jaxco, this is 316, 2011, 1754 EDT. NRC Commissioner Jaxco stated that they believe there is no more water in the spent fuel pool and secondary containment is breached. You know, it's clear with people that if you study these events that have been occurring for the last 20 years, initially the reports will have some honesty and a measure of truth to them. Later when phone calls are made and people are cracking down and there's an information blackout, you know, they tend to clam up, their story changes. So you have to look initially what came out. And this is a perfect example at Fukushima where the NRC says, no, this is definitely what it is. And then later they totally recant that statement. No, we made an honest mistake, uh, had water in it all along. Folks, Wow, that's a, that is a yarn uh, a million miles long. That is a long story to tell right there, isn't it? TEPCO and NISA, those are the Japanese regulators, have not confirmed this statement. Again, they're not going to confirm that statement because they don't want to confirm that reality, right? It doesn't mean it didn't happen. They just don't want to admit it publicly. Japan's government is just as secretive and as corrupt as our government is right now. I love the people of Japan. In my song nuclear reality i say we love you japan i love the people of japan i do not love their corrupt government i do not love the yakuza mafia i don't have energy enough to hate them but neither do i have positive loving feelings towards them okay I understand that their government in tepco just as corrupt as the nrc and our government you need to know that from the 17th low level fuel rod damage suspected well it's probably more than low level folks is what we have to 
the worst case scenario there's no power no coolant i mean it couldn't get any worse there at that nuclear plant explosion that occurred on march 15 is being attributed to hydrogen generated from the spent fuel pool via steam decomposition by radiation or zirconium water reaction under low temperature an analysis of a picture taken from a helicopter on march 16 time unknown indicated that water existed in the unit four spent fuel pool at that time and again very clearly nrc said if there was water in there on that particular analysis from the helicopter it was a splash along the bottom and it won't be there much longer and in fact they they were pretty much adamant they, they didn't believe that they thought that tepco was you know giving them the runaround they wouldn't release the video to them kind of like what happens with us in 9-11 and all these other instances you don't give the video out because it's actually incriminating you say it's national security which means whatever that is might incriminate the government so you label it national security and you classify it, and we don't ever get to see it so keep that in mind you can't trust any of these guys initial reports they disagreed with tepco they said no there's no water they even talked about this lead and sand slurry in my opinion now again it would just be opinion i'm telling you that is they probably ended up having to pour the lead and sand slurry into these things because if you can't contain water if you can't circulate the coolant and if you can't have the ideal coolant in other words if you're pouring salt water into this thing eventually the time is going to run out and you're going to have a catastrophe again anyway so they couldn't really stabilize they would have had to have poured sand and lead into the spent fuel pools and they don't want you to know that they don't want you to know that most of it already burned up and they just covered up what they could left again that's my opinion Okay, now here is from the NRC FOIA documents, and I'm going to read you a uh, telephone transcription between Mr. Castleman and a Mr. Weber. Mr. Castleman. Okay, that's good to know. Next question is the SITREP, that's the situation report, contains a summary of the revised source term. And I was wondering, it says that we're assuming no spent fuel pool fires, and we have core damage in units 1, 2, and 3. Is this an indication that we think that the risk or probability of spent fuel pool contributing to the source term is reduced? And source term means the uh, radioactive emissions. Each place that would emit radiation is considered a source term. A criticality in a reactor that releases radiation and breaches containment could be considered a source term. If a spent fuel pool has a zerk fire and a melt on the floor, that subsequent release would be deemed a source term. So he says, is this an indication that we think that the risk or probability of spent fuel pool contributing to the source term is reduced? Or is it that we're getting heightened concern over the reactors in units 1, 2, and 3? Mr. Weber, it doesn't reflect an increase in our concern about reactors 1, 2, and 3. In terms of spent fuel pool fires, I'm not sure what that indicates. I'm reading it too, and I don't know what that means because of course spent fuel pools are in integrated space male participant oh yes mr weber and as best we can tell there have already been releases from those pools mr castleman yes that's probably true as best we can tell i agree with that i was just trying to get a sense of that you know of what has gone into the thinking in revising the source term mr weber larry do you know larry i do not but we'll find out that will run it down and again, here's indication that source term, they want to downplay it. They don't want you to know that likely all the spent fuel pools melted down and released everything into the atmosphere. It's too catastrophic. The sheeple can't handle it. That is a cold, hard fact. It just simply is. So that source term was revised, and these guys are questioning. They say, look, we know there had to have been releases from these pools. Why are they not including those pools as source terms in this modeling? Okay, does that make sense to you? They're downplaying, they're leaving out a crucial aspect, and that is the fact they all believe these spent fuel pools have melted down, released the radiation, but they're not going to include it in their modeling. And this modeling is what they base any warning or alert or any pregnant women stay out of the rain, don't eat green leafy vegetables, that would have factored in there. So you see when they downplay it, you don't give those warnings. And herein lies the criminality of Plumegate, ladies and gentlemen. And it's just, it's a horror show to me. I mean, it was, uh, it shook me up for about a week when I really dug into these documents and understood the full ramifications of how big the cover-up was and how many is going to be affected by it. Wow, it's, it's shocking, no doubt about it. Bruising to your psyche is exactly what it is. Okay, we're looking at an email from March 14th, 9.43 p.m. from the year 2011. And in this particular email, let me just read the subject. Request for assistance from Tokyo Electric and Power. Just received call from Mr. Katano from Tokyo Power and Electric. 
Unit 4 Fukushima now has fire on site. Request help to extinguish. Nuclear fuel slash oil on fire. And again, we know it wasn't oil because they said a seminal event. It couldn't have been an oil, lube oil fire. NRC was adamant about that. That was the catastrophic meltdown of Unit 4 is what I suspect. Request assistance with fire trucks to extinguish fire. Request assistance with helicopters as well. You know, they had to remote control bulldoze the roads clear of debris and, and spent fuel pool pellets. They were all over the ground. And that's indicated in the documents, and I've proven that and shown the evidence of that. So the fire trucks and stuff were late to get there and weren't very effective. And, and NRC was adamant about that as well. These water cannons aren't doing much. The helicopter drops are ineffective. Again, it was the worst possible circumstances you could have had at a nuclear power plant. End of story. Extinguish requires water slash boron slash boric acid. You can't just pour water on a pyrophoric zirconium cladding fire. I wish it worked that way, but it's not like uh, your campfire. Not at all. In this one, you have to have a special uh, concoction. That's a boric uh, acid or boric boron and water, a mixture, a special a mixture to put it out. I'm not that knowledgeable about exactly what this chemical mixture is, but I know you cannot pour just plain water on it. You have to have a special uh, uh, fire retardant, and that is includes boron or boric acid. They will designate safe area for responders. Again, you couldn't just go into Fukushima Daiichi and park your vehicle and go to work and start picking things up and cleaning up. In some levels, the rads were 400 rem per hour. That's a fatal dose. They even say it's, it's fatal doses there right now. What are they going to do? How are they going to rectify the situation? Okay, next screen capture is a Fukushima Daiichi summary display. This is just, again, another a quick briefing that gives some information. If you look down near the bottom, I have it in red about Unit 4, but also there's some information on Unit 3. So let's look at 4 first and then what they say on 3. Core offloaded to spent fuel pool. Secondary containment destroyed. Walls of SFP spent fuel pool have collapsed. No spent fuel pool cooling is possible at this time. TEPCO requests recommendations, parentheses Moniger. Moniger was embedded with TEPCO. He was right there, TEPCO officials, as things were going down. Now, prior to that, it says, in regards to Unit 3, severe core damage, seawater injection, containment primarily, primary apparently intact, secondary containment destroyed, and that's with having to do with the reactor, the primary containment, spent fuel pool may be in the same condition as Unit 4 spent fuel pool below. And if you look at those HD pics that are circulating around right now, now because people are questioning what's going on, digging around and looking for these pics, you just have to scratch your head and say, how could they have done anything but pour lead and sand into these pools, put a cover over it, and tell people that they're going to load the fuel over time and everything's okay. That's all, that's all they could do. You know, that's all they could. I can't figure out what they're going to do. Be honest with people. Say, yeah, it's a catastrophic extinction level event. Tokyo needs to be evacuated. The West Coast might need to be evacuated. We've got to give warnings. We've got to find another food supply. Oh, we're in big trouble. But we wanted you guys to know, Obama wants you to know what he knows as president. Right? Gosh. That's one of the biggest lies out there was that Rose Garden speech where Obama said he wanted you to know what he knows as president. Right? That's a quote. Exact quote. It's exactly what he said. Okay, next screen cap. Unit 4. Again, it's another brief. It gives dates, times, and a little bit of information. Sometimes you got to read through the lines because what TEPCO says in their briefs, you have to take with a grain of salt. They've lied time and time and time again, just as the NRC have. The highlighted section says 316, 2011, 1645 EDT. Actually, for, from 315, I guess the J, Japan time is what JST is, I suspect. So 1645 EDT, 315, 2011. TEPCO reported another fire in the reactor building that was extinguished itself within two hours. TEPCO was planning to battle the fire and add water to the spent fuel pool using helicopters, but abandoned the plan because a hole in the roof was not in line with the pool. So they couldn't helicopter water in it. That thing sat there with nothing. And even when the water cannons were there, the spray, most of it dissipated and didn't even reach the thing. There was discussions about how much is actually reaching it and how much is trickling down in the pool. They were unable to add water to the pool at a sufficient pace 
to make up for the volume that was leaking out of the pool. If you have a glass and there's a hole in the bottom of the glass, if you add water fast enough, even though it's leaking out the bottom, you can fill that glass with water. That if the hole at the bottom is bigger than the amount you can pour in at the top, it just leaks right back out the bottom and you cannot maintain sufficient inventory in that spent fuel pool. And then naturally you're gonna have the temperatures rise and you're gonna have the zirconium pyrophoric fire. It's inevitable. Next screen cap is an email from March 19th, 8.01 a.m. To Paul Clifford, subject RE, proposal to handle dried spent fuel pool. It is an interesting proposal, but it presumes that the damage is still in the process of being done. At a minimum, I think we should assume that the leak tightness in most of the fuel rods is gone, and that most of the rod-like geometry is also gone. The result is a rubble much like Three Mile Island. I would mention here they called in a guy who had expertise at Three Mile Island with the spent fuel uh, melt situation there. Now why would they call him in if we didn't have a similar situation in these other pools? As the result is rubble much like Three Mile Island. The evidence for this is the long uncover periods and the presence of cesium and iodine outside the plant. The question at the moment is how much zirconium metal water reaction has taken place, parentheses, not just zirconium hydride reaction, close parentheses, because it, provi it provides most, but not all, of the heat source. If there is much zirconium metal left, it is prudent to cool it rather than inert it, because even a little water provides additional oxidizing agent. Okay, that's oxidizing means fuel for that fire. If there is little zirconium metal left, it is prudent to seal the containment leakage past rather than inert it because there is only decay heat to worry about. Okay, and in this email, you kind of see the discussion of the dry pool, rubble on the floor. I mean, this is fairly consistent throughout the documents. If you dig through them, you can find these kind of emails in there. And, and this is what they were discussing at March 19th. Dry spent fuel pool, rubble on the floor. Okay, here's a transcription, telephone conference from the FOIA documents where Mr. Brown is talking to Mr. Casto. Mr. Brown, yes, Chuck, in my discussion this morning with INPO, International Nuclear Plant Operators, INPO took three action items out of the meeting that you're discussing. Gamma spectrometry list, there, of course, INPO's coordinating closely with DOE. The remote water measurement issue and technology for removing damage spent fuel from the pool. So INPO's got it, and then we've told DOE, the embedded person, and we're getting them linked up. Mr. Casto, great. I think ultimately probably what's going to happen is that the, and that's the end of that one right there. And you can see in this one the discussion uh, clearly of removing damage spent fuel from the pool. So again, indication that if there is some left to be removed, it may be damaged, and there might not be that much there. Some of the fuel rods that were unused would not have generated that same amount of heat, and there was discussion if those are off in a corner, maybe those would be, were saved somehow. But the rest was non-checkerboarded fuel and very likely uh, went through the worst of the worst there. Okay, next screen capture. This is Chuck Castro speaking, and, and this first one I included because it discusses this equipment staging zone and it kind of strikes to just the severity of the rad levels around Fukushima at the time where Mr. Castro says I'm sorry that's well let me back up male participant says what is the J village the J dash village I was like what are they talking about J village Mr. Castro I'm sorry that's a Japan village it's outside the EP that that zone you know the 13 kilometer zone where they stage equipment for moving in and out of the plant. So 13 kilometers out, they're able to stage equipment in a zone where the radiation levels are low enough that they've decided they can stage equipment there. And that's important to know because don't think you can just drive trucks and stuff in there and start making repairs. It was not like that at all. Okay, Castro goes on to say, I don't really understand. I was a bit confused. I mean, they wanted to defuel the spent fuel pools and I don't know where they're going to put it. And some of that stuff came out of unit four. If it's left, if there's anything left there, let's put that way, you know, it's hot. Where are you going to put it? You know, you don't have a spent fuel pool, a spare spent fuel pool off somewhere. So I'm a little bit confused about their plan. You know, we all know that with the end in mind, so you got to have the end in mind. And they don't have any place to put all that stuff. So I don't know what their plan is. We'll deal with it tomorrow when they start standing up these groups, but they want to consider everything from sand 
to a sarcophagus. They're defueling the plant and they want to look at all their options. Okay, this one's very revealing because it, number one, it looks at their options. If they're concerning sand and sarcophagus, we know there is major damage there. And he, he's very clear about what fuel they're going to get out. And if they do, it's going to be hot. Where are they going to put it? You're going to load it into one of those dry casks? This fuel is not dry caskable fuel. Again, this whole Unit 4 offloading operation hoax hinges on you not knowing the facts. You, you, if you know the facts about nuclear power and how these things work, as I am learning myself, then you understand the official story, the alternative media story. All these trolls and shills are telling you bunk. It doesn't add up. Here's Casto saying, even if you pull the fuel out, it's so hot. What do you do with it? You'd have to drop it in another pool almost instantly. You're going to put it in one of those dry cast containers? It'll burn right through that. This stuff is an intense heat. It's gone through a, a, a zirconium fire, some of them at least, and the rest of the stuff had to have been affected. The water level dropped. You know, you can't just go in and pick the stuff up, load into dry cast, haul it off and store it somewhere. That is a fantasy land fairy tale that just cannot, the physics just don't add up, okay? They just don't add up. And there's Castor, like I say, out of all these guys in these documents, if there's anyone I have any respect for, it's Chuck Castor. He seems to have been consistent throughout the documents. He didn't change his story. And furthermore, he seemed pretty serious about his job. When some of the young guys were cutting up, he tells them to cut it out. He's, you know... He's not there to fool around and, and tell jokes or whatever. So I, I kind of like Chuck Casto. Okay, next screen capture. I'll just read you the bottom section to it because this is like a briefing of um, one through four. Attached summarizes the NRC and NISA positions on the status of 1F1 through 1F4. That's Fukushima's units one through four. Please let me know if anything in the attached needs to change. These are the NRC guys talking about it right here. Now we look at this particular graph here and let's go and chart whatever you want to call it first let's look on the right hand side where it's yellowed in NISA assessment based on thermal image and video the video we talked about the one that NRC disputed and said nah if there's any water in there it ain't much and they wouldn't release the video to them to examine it further their story changed very shifty shady the thermal imaging was questioned by NRC because they said your thermal imaging won't be accurate if the roof is caved in, if there's debris on top, that is going to block heat. You'll have a lower reading. We're not getting accurate readings. We cannot be certain that these readings are accurate. So this note being made here is that NICE assessment is based on thermal imaging, questionable, and the video, questionable. Okay, now let's look at what NRC had to say on these, and you can compare and contrast, and, and let's just... Uh, let's look at units three and four, and let's look at unit three first. RPV, reactor pressure vessel, that's where it all goes. The nuclear reaction, likely damaged. Containment, likely damaged. Core, likely damaged. Spent fuel pool. Indeterminate, insufficient data to reach conclusion. Well, we've seen enough information now that they had already reached their conclusion on that kind of behind the scenes. And had been vocal about that as well, because again, JAXCO went before Congress to tell them the spent fuel pool four was dry, later to recant that statement and say, hey, we just made a honest mistake. Anybody could have missed that pool being full of water the whole time, right? Okay, unit four, NRC says likely damaged, H2 generated from zirconium steam reaction. Again, I'm just showing you evidence from the FOIA documents that controverts, that contradicts the official much of alternative media, many of these so-called anti-nuclear figureheads that are speaking out right now, they don't talk about this stuff. And at the end of this video, I'm going to give you a list of eight things that I've uncovered in these documents. I told everybody these documents were explosive. Okay, they attacked me, they trolled me, they dismissed me, but now things are changing because some important people have taken notice of what I've been uh, putting out there into the realm of public information. Again, it, the information is what I want to put on trial. Okay, not Hattrick Penry. I'm just the messenger. Don't hate the messenger. Next email from Mark 29th. Some of these I'm doing in sequential order by date. From Giulia, Giulia Bisconti, nuclear.energy.gov. And this is to NIT Solutions. This is a, well, let's just go down this, this email and you understand what it's about. Dear all, as requested, this is an update of how I am helping in Tokyo for the week. My main duty is to be embedded with the NRC team at the embassy. I am also performing other duties where I can be helpful to Ron and Alicia. They have both been very welcoming. Julia, here are some items of interest. Okay, here's where it gets good. Well, again, like I underlined, my main duty is to be embedded with the NRC team at the embassy. 
and we also had utility execs here at a meeting uh, tsunami Japan earthquake and tsunami drill which coincidentally occurred at the same time of the Fukushima event so we had utility execs here from Japan we had translators they can't say the NRC can't say they didn't know I mean, you couldn't have had a better communication system possibly set up the day of the Fukushima disaster because you already had a Japan earthquake and tsunami drill simultaneously, coincidentally, occurring as the tsunami and earthquake went down. That's incredible, isn't it? It says two PNNL experts to visit Japan at the request of Japan to help on water decontamination and storage issues. Japanese government is seeking private sector experts on fuel rod slash pool issues with hands-on Three Mile Island experience per NRC meetings. Okay, and I told you at least one guy I know of in an email, they sent him in there to as an expert and he had previous experience with Three Mile Island and the spent fuel partial melt at Three Mile. Let's go down to the bottom and read my highlighted section. Uh, participate in NRC meeting issues, remove heat from the reactor, structural concerns for the pools, controlling releases, water management is a big issue, are the Japanese workers wearing adequate protective clothing, flooding, continued leakages, question mark, need to establish the water level of the pools, want to get water above the rods, maybe three to four feet above, plenty of indication ran dry, water went below the rods. And again, Kathy Gibson had access to this email. And in what you do in a real investigation, they would subpoena people for deposition. You would be questioned. We want to know what you knew and when. And certain emails and statements indicate that certain players knew certain things at a certain time, but withheld that information intentionally from the American public. That's the direction that the investigation would initially take, is my assumption, is how the Department of Justice, if we had a Department of Justice that really worked for the people and didn't just protect the corporate and the politicians, they would immediately begin to subpoena people like Kathy Gibson from the NRC and take um, recorded depositions under oath and find out what they knew and when. Of course, I've already provided plenty of information and a bunch of these guys what they knew and when. Okay, this particular letter from Micro Simulation Technology. Subject, Fukushima Spent Fuel Pool Fire Study. Two friends in nuclear industry. Back in 2002, after the 9-11 event, a concern was raised on sabotage to spent fuel pools. We developed a simulator predicting the consequence following a loss of coolant and or cooling event. It was presented at National Radiological Emergency Conference. The Fukushima Unit 4 fire unfortunately turned the scenario into reality, instead by natural force. Well, we're questioning that now because, again, there was a Japan tsunami and earthquake drill that occurred coincidentally on that same day was it by natural force we're questioning that now here we use the tool pc trans slash sfp to study the event as attached some kind of modeling is what that is it reproduced the sequence of a pool heat up leakage via cracks fuel exposure and cladding damage all the way to environmental release it appears that reliability of spent fuel pools is greatly overlooked a supplemental spray system as drawn in our 2002 paper may be necessary. I'd appreciate very much to learn your comment. There's a very telling, very revealing email. Number one, we, we, do we need a secondary backup spray system? Hmm, I don't know. And right here, when the guy says it turned it into reality, okay, this was the, the, the meltdown of a spent fuel pool was turned into reality. They had done a simulation before, but now it had actually happened, the guy is saying. Okay, again, from the FOIA documents, this is Mr. Casto speaking. And he says, open up the Demon water line, D-E-M-I-N. That's probably a misspell. Unit 4 spent fuel structurally looks like it's sound, or it's at least there on structure, but we can't. I think they finally have concluded that there's probably no water in it. There's no steam, and they understand the physics of that. No steam, no water. So I think we're, hopefully, we've over that issue but it still looms out there somewhere but honestly I'm moving beyond I'm moving past that issue the helicopter operations just did not work we know that redacted 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 and again uh, hat trick penny I want to move on past this issue of spent fuel pool number four as well because it 
overwhelming evidence indicates the worst has already happened there. They're pulling a hoax over on us. They've probably either done the sarcophagi or the lead and sand mixture. They put a cover conveniently over these units, a one through four, so now we can't see, and we just have to take their word for it, even though all the documentation flies in the face of everything, the mainstream, much of alternative, a lot of YouTubers, Facebookers are trying to tell us about Unit 4 Offload. Okay, that does it for the information I have on Unit 4. Again, what I just read to you, those screen captures, they're not found in fear and loathing. Uh, they're not found in something wicked this way comes. That was recently, some of those were sent to me from Shazam and Maureen, and some I dug up myself. But again, this is all new information that just continues to bolster this mountain of evidence that says the exact opposite of what the official story seems to be. Now, let's have a look quickly at my information on Unit 3. It's not that much. Again, there's a lot of redaction in these documents. There may be more to know about Unit 3 and 4, but they are redact 30 pages in a row. In fact, there's one that says calculations for spent fuel pool for boil off, and it's like 20, 30 pages are redacted. You don't get to see anything after that, anything at all. Now, if it didn't happen, why can't we see it? Hmm. Okay, 3-18-2011. 1200 EDT phone call with EPRI, NRC, NR, TEPCO. Discussions about filling Unit 3 and 4 spent fuel pool. Why would you have a discussion about filling the pool if it was not empty? Okay, so we know at some time at least these pools at least each once ran dry one time. Or pretty darn close to it. Recommended using borated water versus borated water slash sand slurry. Concerned with heat capacity and amount that can be injected without damaging structural integrity of spent fuel pool liner and concrete. In other words, if it's smoldering super hot down there and you pour this ocean water on it, what do you think is going to happen? What happens when you take a hot glass that you've put in your campfire and warmed up and you throw it in a bucket of water? It cracks. It shatters. And they know that's going to happen. They also know that when you add this water, you're going to be quote unquote, this is NRC's term, shooting the source term. And it's going to create an incredible source term. An incredible amount of radiation will be released. Even if you try to regain cooling geometry by pouring water in there. And good luck with that. Because I don't think that happened. You know, I'm told from reliable a source, Shazam, that once you lose that cooling geometry, you don't get it back. You just don't get it back. What happens, happens. When it all burns down, it is what it is. Recommended not alternating flow between reactor vessel and spent fuel pool. Concerned with thermal shock to fuel if injection is stopped. Okay, here's from another brief out of the FOIA documents, this little chart. And you can look down at Unit 3 in red. Core, damage, cooling, RCS depressurized, radiation released. Primary containment, some damage. Secondary containment, lost. Spent fuel pool, low water. And you look, Unit 4 is about the same thing there, low water there as well. Secondary containment, lost. Primary, some damage. Okay, from the FOIA documents from a telephone transcription conversation, here is Dan speaking. He says, yes, I don't want to jinx the last hour and a half, but the facility status is similar to yesterday. The Japanese focuses more on Unit 3 than on Unit 4, and there is redacted, redacted, redacted. They have had Japanese self-defense force helicopters dropping water on Unit 3. Units 5 and 6 seem to have gotten the cooling back into their pool, using power from diesel in Unit 5. Things are pretty much where they are. And again, you see here they're focusing on Unit 3, and it seems to be a priority at some point. They say, look, don't worry about Unit 4. I mean, Unit 4 is, woo, it's bad. But Unit 3 is even worse, even worse. And if you look at the HD pics, Unit 3 and Unit 4, I provided these before. You can find them online if you look around. Uh, that's very revealing as to the real extent of the damage. Structurally speaking, an engineer will tell you this. Looking at Unit 4 tilting to the side, an engineer would look at you, a structural engineer, and say you'll never uh, have the structure back to that building that would be reliable and safe. You just can't do it. You demolish it is what we do, and we build another is typically what we do. Of course, this is, again, a nuclear reactor. You just can't do that. Okay, I'm including this one because this particular screen capture is indicative of them downplaying. They know that Unit 3 has also released radiation to the atmosphere. And when they do model it and, and estimate the dose estimate, they're downplaying it because they're not factoring in the use of MOX fuel, mixed oxide fuel that contains a higher percentage of plutonium 
and thus it's much more deadly, much more dangerous when there is a reactor criticality or a spent fuel meltdown when we're dealing with MOX fuel. That is why the controversy over MOX fuel, and that is why nobody wants a MOX fuel plant anywhere, let alone any nuclear plant, but we certainly don't want to start using MOX fuel. It's very dangerous, and this shows they're downplaying that danger again. This strikes to the cover-up of Plumegate, and this is a criminality when they know it was worse than what they told us and we got blasted with no warnings. Now let's look at the particular highlighted section and this is they're discussing other countries uh, comments and angles on this particular thing and they, they discuss Russia and Canada and so on and so forth but you get down here to the Canadians and let's see what they say about uh, the Canadians here. It says there was a discussion on the 32 MOX assemblies in the Unit 3 spent fuel pool and the MOX fuel assemblies placed in the Unit 3 reactor vessel in September 2010. The other countries explained how they individually were evaluating and calculating the release path and dose estimates. They asked if the NRC had revised dose numbers for our source terms. Told them that we could discuss at the 1400 call today. So Canada is saying, look, are you, are you sure you're not missing the fact that these are MOX fuel assemblies and thus the dose rates will be increased. It won't be as you would, you wouldn't model that as you would with a normal uh, fuel rod. This is a special case, a higher level of plutonium. You would input different parameters into the program and it would spit back a higher dose estimate at location X, Y, or Z. It's really that simple. And Canada here is saying, hey, uh, are you doing that? I don't think you're doing that. You need to evaluate and calculate those particular doses based on the MOX. You need to revise your dose numbers is what they're saying okay criminal absolutely criminal they knew it was a lot worse than that they knew about the mox fuel they knew about spent fuel pool four number three everything else they downplayed it and now folks we're all stuck we're beginning to hear it on the west coast starfish and the polar bears and the people's getting sick and just as we've told you guys if you research and study chernobyl you know five to ten years those cancers really begin to kick in the worst is yet to come we're on the cusp of the big increase in cancers, thyroid problems, heart conditions, radiation sickness, so on and so forth, you name it. It is coming. It will be undeniable. They won't be able to deny it within a matter of a couple, three years is my estimation. Again, that's my opinion and my estimation right there. Okay, next uh, screen cap is from a back and forth in the emails from some guys from the NRC. Let me try to read them in time sequential order. So first we have Edward McCann to Phil Qualls, and he says, Oh, swell, Unit 3 has mocks. Does the SFP have mocks? I thought not. 3.25 p.m., Phil Qualls responds. He says, The below is a photo that the press calls a fire in U3, Unit 3, during the event. When I took a second look, I wondered what happened to the quote-unquote smoke. The plume sort of ends, not dissipate like thick smoke usually does. This looks much more like a steam plume during cold weather. Parentheses, remember, it is still cold there as they had snow. In parentheses, and in parentheses again, at least to my experience, but we'll defer to Mark as concerning smoke behavior. In parentheses, this may really be the Unit 3 spent fuel pool boil off. The amount of steam seems a lot for decay heat. This may really be nuclear heat from an undesired criticality and he's referring to inside the spent fuel pool of number three where the MOX fuel would be located. And they, they're going to discuss that, but he basically, uh, they're, they're discussing the steam versus smoke issue, so on and so forth. I think I have a Der Spiegel picture of this. Yes, here we go in the next screen capture. Uh, I've kind of blown up his that last email comment, and then you can see the top. This was a better definition than the other one I'm going to show you in a second. But you can look at the steam and vapors coming off in the top of Unit 3 is just collapsed down. The metal's twisted from the heat. And again, they can, I've read in there where they said the metal at first when the roofs collapsed, it wasn't all twisted. It was after the meltdowns in 3 and 4 that those um, steel girders began to melt and twist. And they discussed it. I think I include that on Fear and Loathing on Fukushima Unit 4, that particular bit of information. So looking at that twisted metal down there, that occurred after the intense heat from the spent fuel criticality, spent fuel pool criticality. And this next one is very poor uh, definition. I understand that, but for your information, this picture is from the Der Spiegel, and it says, thick white smoke billows from the number three 
unit of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. And again, they say, hey, that looks like the last bit of steam coming off of that. What you get in the mainstream and what you get in these documents, again, or alternative media and YouTubers and all that for that matter, are totally different in these documents, what they're saying. And that's why I tell people right now, you can look and see who's working for the establishment because they avoid these documents. They won't talk about these documents and they attack people who do talk about these documents. So it's really crystal clear. You're looking through a lens right now. Oh, there, the emperor wears no clothes. I've warned people about this organized disinformation ring, and they've continued to operate with impunity in this country, denying the American public information that would save lives of women and children. Folks, again, I've been clear, that's treason. That's, this, this, this information ring is incredibly treasonous. I'll put it that way. Okay, from the FOIA documents pertaining to Fukushima, here's another phone transcription of a male participant. We don't always get to know who's speaking, but let's examine what this person says. We got a live, well, I don't know if it's live, but we got a television projection of this right now in front of us. NHK World is showing the fire trucks. And in the meeting, we talked to them and we said, you know, that spent fuel pool is hot as hell down in there. So when they start dumping in these massive amounts of water, there's going to be some very energetic interaction. They're going to be, they should be expecting a significant source term from this. I mean, if that water, if these rods and all that are 1,000, 2,000 degrees, whatever, they're going to get a lot of energetic reaction from putting in this water. And they're going to be shooting the source term, etc. So they've just got to, they've got to do something, but they have to know that it'll result in a decent source term coming off. So we see even in a good situation where some of the rods melted, but some didn't, when they go to add that water, massive release of radiation folks and that's what they don't want you to know they don't want you to know that next screen captured male participant just a question chuck said that they think that unit three pool is dry do they still redacted redacted do they still see a vapor plume coming off of unit three male participant negative male participant okay so they think that all of that steam in the path was the evaporation of the unit three pool and that that's now completed Male participant, yes. Male participant, we'll shoot you a one-page fax if I can figure out how to use the fax form. It's their calculations. They have no measurements, but it's their calculations on water, evaporation rates, the amount of water they should have, what they think is left, and volume needed, and time margins, etc. Male participant, some of the things that would make that calculation, I would think, a little uncertain, would be as when this earthquake hit, so on and so forth. And they talk about water sloshing out of the pool, etc., etc. What's important here is this particular, you know, incredible description where back and forth they're saying, is it, has it boiled off? And the guy says, yes. Is there any more vapors, water vapor? No. Has it boiled off? Yes. Very indicative that Unit 3 suffered the same fate as Unit 4. I find no evidence in these documents to indicate that Unit 3 or Unit 4 got out of it unscathed. I, I can't find it. In fact, the damage I keep, continue to read about is catastrophic to these two spent fuel pools and likely to one and two as well. They just don't want you to know. And now the covers are up. TEPCO can say anything they want in national security, state secrets, secret security, whatever their reason is for not allowing us a film crew in there to look around. It's totally bunk, totally bunk. It's a hoax that is, you know. We're being hoodwinked is what I'm trying to say. All of America and the world, they're trying to hoodwink us right now. That's a technical term. Okay, one more screen cap, Mr. Casto. So don't wait on boron injections to inject water. They shared some photographs with the images that they took from a helicopter that they claim shows water in the Unit 3 spent. I think it is Unit 3, right, John? John, Unit 4. Casto, Unit 4? John, no, I believe you're correct. 3, Mr. Casto. It was Unit 3 spent fuel pool, and it is still dubious to us. There is a little shine on one little section of the image. And they said, hey, that's water. I mean, they have told us that before with the, when the helicopter flew by on the video, but, you know, that's still not proof. And they said that they have gone, this was an initial analysis. So Casto's been the same story all the way through has never changed. He doesn't believe TEPCO from the beginning. Okay, and here's another one we looked at previously with my spent fuel pool for information uh, in the beginning of this video. Here's that, that particular chart again. You can look down and see the status of three and four are walls spent fuel pool of collapse no spent fuel pool cooling possible this time and then it says unit uh, three may be in the same condition as unit four 
Okay, from the FOIA documents, continued conversation about Unit 3. Mike, dose rates have not changed significantly at the site like I previously reported, but they do indicate that with the return of water in Unit 3 spent fuel pool, that, of course, that lowered the RAD level. Measurements on site and around the site continue to support the productive action recommendation for the 50-mile evacuation. You are aware of the reporting over the weekend that they did find elevated levels of radio iodine in spinach and in milk. You are certainly aware of that. Dr. Jacksco, yes. Mike, Charlie Miller is down on his way to the White House to support that meeting to agree on the quote-unquote worst case so that we can come to resolution on that and actually have NARAC make the runs that we were pushing to make some time ago. There's evidence of delay on the real runs, the real modeling that might have been more revealing. White House is involved. They're downplaying everything. Uh, radiation, the spinach, and then the milk. And then we're talking about Unit 4 with the return of water and Unit 3 spent fuel pool. Okay, there was no water in it at some point. And it don't sit like that for very long, folks, before you have this energetic reaction and a criticality. That's just physics, the physics of the reality of our universe, or at least in the section of the universe we find ourselves in in this time period. Okay, folks, and that uh, apparently that ends the this little bit I have on Unit 3. I've probably got a lot of more stuff floating around, but my desktop is a mess. I'm trying to get things in order, and that, that should be enough, again, to show you that what happened to Unit 3 and Unit 4, very similar situations. Check out some of the HD pics circulating online. And again, decide for yourself what you think the story is. But just keep an open mind. And always remember, look at the opposing side's point of view. If you're a follower of particular media outlet A, B, or C, or X, Y, or Z, and, and their story is different than mine, please look at my story and vice versa. If I give you a story but someone else says, hey, we have a different version, go look at all the information because until you have garnered the entire amount of information you can possibly have, you're, you can't make that ultimate informed decision for yourself, what you believe, okay? And quickly, before I take off, I'm going to read to you, and this will finish this video, the eight things, very quickly, that I have found in these FOIA documents that everyone's avoiding through mainstream, through alternative, the anti-nuke figureheads won't talk about it, all these YouTube channels that I believe are controlled opposition, all these Facebook pages and characters I believe are controlled opposition. It is huge and it is stunning and overwhelming when you realize how many are avoiding such a serious topic and that it cannot be an accident or a coincidence, okay? Number one. The world's largest provable cover-up involving President Obama and multiple agencies. That's the big that's the big one found in these documents. Proven. Proven. I've made the case. Something wicked this way comes. Please read my book. It's totally free. I've never asked for money and never will. Number two. Navy ships were knowingly exposed to high levels of radiation. I have a screen capture where they say if you're worried about having angst about moving Navy ships, run a bunch of worst case scenarios and pick the least worst case scenario and you won't have to move the Navy ships. I'm paraphrasing there, but it's pretty close to what the guys say. Number three, TEPCO. Intentionally discharge radioactive water into the Pacific since April of 2011. I proved that with documentation where TEPCO admitted it. In these documents all along, TEPCO had already admitted that. Now, had all these media outlets and figureheads dug into these documents like I told them to begin with, they would have found early on TEPCO was dumping that one. They could have proved it. Instead, they did nothing. And because nobody else would report on it, I did. And I broke that story officially that TEPCO's admission of dumping, intentionally discharging high level, in some cases, high level radioactive water into the Pacific, that was proven in the documents. Now, after I posted up that particular video and wrote about that, yes, mainstream began to leak out the fact water was going into the Pacific, and now it's all over the place. They avoided these documents, and again, folks, myself and other researchers sent this information around to all your favorite alternative media outlets. We beg these anti-nuke figureheads to talk about it, and they won't. We send them the information, we prompt them, they ignore us. I'll leave you to your own conclusion on that, although I have my opinion on that, and I'm, I'm uh, vocal about it. Number four, Bechtel hosed the American public for $9.8 billion for their pumping system that Japan didn't want, and they were vocal about it. They said they didn't want it. They tried to push it on them, and in the, in the end, Japan didn't want to pay for it. Guess what? The DOD pays for it. Aren't that nice? $9.8 billion, and you, the taxpayer, will end up footing that bill for pumps that TEPCO Japan didn't even want. Bechtel made the money on that little debacle. Number five, a quote-unquote Japan earthquake and tsunami drill occurred simultaneously as a Fukushima event. 
Many of you know that during 9-11, Vigilant Guardian was being run, a, a drill that was simultaneously run. Many of you are aware of the Federal Building drill, the Oslo bombing drill, the Aurora drill, Sandy Hook drill, it goes on and on, so on and so forth. Indicated in these documents is that there is a drill that occurred between utility execs from Japan and NRC. Okay, and NARAC was involved and so on and so forth. It's quite a huge conspiracy, and like I say, hundreds if not thousands are going to, you know, have to be arrested before this is all over. And so that's also an important thing that we found in these FOIA documents that nobody seems to want to talk about or mention. Six, there is evidence that we have many non-seismically qualified spent fuel pools here in the U.S. That should worry you. Number seven. Our nuclear plants are not prepared for a tsunami slash earthquake co-event of the Fukushima magnitude. That should worry you as well. And finally, number eight, Unit 4 and Unit 3 for that matter, lost all its fuel in a pyrophoric fire and likely released its radiation directly to the atmosphere. And I provided a lot of evidence of that. I'll link to my fear and loathing and to something wicked this way comes. And that pretty much sums up this particular video. I wanted to cover those eight points from what I found in these documents that they don't want to talk about. It's a very revealing once you know the important subject and who all is unwilling to speak about it. Okay, so that covers it for this video. I'm sorry it took so long, but this information was critical to get out there to you, the American public, and uh, uh, we'll talk to you again later in a future video. This is Patrick Penry, over and out. This has been an HP News Network special report. We need to get subscribed and get this unity stronger and beat YouTube at their own game. Okay, that's what this is about. Like I say, go to the remix button, hit the remix button. That way you'll have this video and, and keep up with this. Otherwise, you know, YouTube's just going to control us, guys, and it's, it's really bad.